We've been talking about Satan's strategy. And remember a couple weeks ago we started talking about uh, just being worn down, running to and fro, and Satan loves to just wear us down to the place where we're tired, we're discouraged, we're fatigued, we're just kind of in despair, and we just kind of give up. And that's one of the strategies. And then we moved on to another strategy. We said that he just, he viciously attacks our weaknesses, which is why it is so dangerous for us to hide or to keep hidden sins or secret sins in our heart because you're leaving the front door wide open for the enemy to come in and to kill and to destroy. And so we went on from there. I think Thursday night we talked about condemnation and guilt. He is the accuser of the brethren. And as he accuses you day and night, the scripture says, before the throne of God, it affects you. You can feel the oppression that comes from that. Just like he fully expected Job to fail, just like he wanted to sift Peter. Remember, in Peter's denial three times, he one of the greatest tools that he uses is to heap on us condemnation and guilt. So heavy at times we feel like we can't even breathe. Have you been there? And he uses that to discourage us and to prevent us from seeking our God. The one I want to talk about this morning is this, and this is, uh, boy, this is happening more and more, especially in the American church. Christians in America, we need a really good, solid purging. Some persecution would only help, it wouldn't hurt. People in other nations that are being persecuted, they don't have the problems in the church, the problems with carnality that we have in, in America, and it's because they're being purified. He says here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. He says, even now many Antichrists have come. Satan knows that if he can get sin in the church, in this church, then he has a foothold. He has a domain where he can come in and wreak havoc and strife and confusion among us. Paul, in addressing the Corinthians, you remember, he said, look, because you guys are not partaking of the Lord's Supper properly, many of you are sick and some have even died. Uh, they firmly believed that sickness was directly related to sin in their life. That's why James says, if any among you are sick, bring the elders in, pray for one another, and your sins will be forgiven. If we confess our faults one to another, if we pray for one another, we can be healed, James says. And so there is a very close link in the scriptures to this. But the fact of the matter is, many antichrists have already come, and they're already spreading their lies and deceit and sinful ways into the church today. This is a, I don't know how clearly you all will be able to see this, maybe not at all. Neil, I may have to just steal your notes for a minute. But um, how many of you have ever heard of Ligonier Ministries? Uh, they are conservative evangelical. And they do a survey every two years to keep their finger on the pulse of doctrine and theology in the church, specifically America, and specifically conservative evangelical Christians. Now, when you think of conservative evangelical Christians, they are the torchbearers, right? I mean, at least back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I mean, they are the orthodox, conservative, Bible-thumping, Bible-believing Christians, right? So this survey was done among that group of Christians here in America. What do Americans think about God, Jesus Christ, sin, and eternity? And it tells you that every two years they conduct this and then compare the results. Boy, that's a... Okay, thank you very much. I'll give this right back to you. So... I don't know if you can read it. It is in your notes, but first, uh, first one, 
And this went on for pages and pages. I just pulled out a few. Number one, they took this survey. This was the question. God answers the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 52% of evangelical Christians agree with that. So whatever happened to I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man can come to the Father but by me. As we go down here, just very quickly, I don't want to get caught up in this, but sometimes the, uh, the percentage of disagreement even speaks louder than the agreement. Number two, religious belief is a matter of personal opinions. It is not about objective truth. 60% of evangelical Christians agree with that. Only 30% disagree, which meant the other 10% were kind of, they probably had their flu shot and were kind of lost for the survey. <laughs> but uh, now think about this. If What's happening here? The spirit of Antichrist is grooming the church for a one-world government and a one-world religion, period. That's what's happening here. If we really believe that God receives worship from all religions, you're not going to mind taking the mark of the beast and being under the domain of one-world religion and government. If religious belief really is a matter of personal opinion, and it's not objective truth, everything is relative to the situation or to the culture or to the timing, my gosh, just throw the Bible out. Why, why have it anymore? Number three, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally Jew, literally, literally true. 53% of evangelical Christians agree. Isn't that amazing? This was just done this, this, uh, this year. Worshiping alone, I think I'm here, worshiping alone or with one's family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church. 58% agree. The Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior doesn't apply today. 44% agree. So without taking too much time, and you know, surveys can be uh, misleading. With a survey, you always have to accept a certain measure of inaccuracy. So, you know, I'm not banking the farm on this survey. All I'm saying is this does give an indication of where Christianity in America is headed and how, why we are going to have to make a stand doctrinally and scripturally. Jude chapter 1 verse 3 says this, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. I'd say it needs to be earnestly contended for, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. They come in speaking the name of Jesus. They come in pretending to be a Christian. They come in quoting verses out of the Bible. But they've crept in without notice, secretly. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. And so in other words, they say, it is all right for you to continue in your sinful behavior. God loves you. He will forgive you. And you don't even have to make an effort to repent or be free. It's okay. God understands. And that's what it means to turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, to deny our only master and Lord, to deny Jesus will not be master of my life. I am in control of my life and my own decisions. And so we see this perversion coming into the church in many different ways to where it's okay to live in habitual sin. And recently we've made a distinction between habitual, deliberate sin 
and Christians who occasionally sin. There's a big difference there. And we'll talk about that more as we get into the study. He says, now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. These people were saved out of Egypt by a mighty, miraculous deliverance of God. And then they ended up in the wilderness and began to doubt and question and grumble and complain, and they were no longer obedient to God's plan and will. And so what did God have to do? Destroy them. And what he's saying here, what the Spirit of God is saying here, is don't think you're any better, don't think you're any different. If our lives are not progressing in sanctification, if we're not sinning less and obeying more, verse 5 could be talking about you and me. He goes and he gives another example of angels who did not, uh, who did not keep their own domain. They fell from their service of God. They fell from the holiness of God. One third that went into rebellion. Abandon their proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Don't think because you've experienced the presence of God and the holiness of God, and then you turn your back and return to your sinful ways. Don't think judgment's not coming for you, because it is. This is the point that he's trying to make. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now I apologize. Some of these slides may not come out real good on the, on the projector. But taking what we just read from Jude and seeing how we must contend for the faith, and contend for holiness, and how we can't tolerate sin. I wanted to just discuss, and I'm going to try to make this very quick, so it's going to be a very high view, very general description. But for the past 20, 30 years, there's been a big debate in churches. Are we a missional church, or are we an attractional church? Has anybody here heard of those two terms as it relates to ministry? Or Okay, so what it means is this. The attractional churches um, believe that the unbelievers, the world, the communities around the church should be attracted and want to come to church. Missional is a little bit different in that when we come together as the church, the church comes together and we come together to worship God and to study his word and to love and serve one another. And then we, when we go out, you, the individual, has the mission of preaching the gospel to the people on your job, to the people in your neighborhood, to the people. You're going to reach people. You know people that the church, this gathering, will never have an opportunity to minister to. And so missional means that we come together, we gather as the church, we worship God, we edify one another, and then the individual members go out into the community and one-on-one -on -one spread the gospel. Attractional is just the opposite of we want to bring everybody into the church, which gets into a very long discussion that we won't get into this morning. Is the church for believers or is the church for unbelievers? Who's supposed to be? Is this church service... For unbelievers, or is this church service for believers? Now, if an unbeliever comes in, they're welcome to come in. Nobody's going to shut them out or say that they can't be here. But when you just start to think of some very general principles, Jesus is the head of his church, right? And when we come together, who is it that's enabling and empowering and administering the gifts to move among us? You know, most you guys have talked about it in other churches where um, you have a, a the worship service is more like a rock concert and the music is just so loud, blows your hair off, and uh, and they keep it rapid fire. They don't allow any interlude in between songs because God forbid that the Holy Spirit might want to speak. 
and we've slammed the door on the Holy Spirit and shut him out of the churches when he's the one that's supposed to be in charge of the service, right? And so are we missional or are we attractional? Let me just show you, read through just a couple excerpts here. In recent years, a new movement within the evangelical church has come into vogue. I thought that was a magazine, but I looked it up in the dictionary, and I guess it means to be cool, right? Contemporary, modern. Commonly referred to as a seeker-sensitive. Generally, this movement has seen a great deal of growth. Many seeker churches are now mega churches with well-known pastors who are riding a wave of popularity in the evangelical world. The seeker-sensitive movement claims millions of conversions, commands vast resources, continues to gain popularity, and seems to be attracting millions of unchurched people into its fold. All right, so this is the attractional thought process, the attractional paradigm or model of church to where we bring everybody we can in. Basically, the seeker-sensitive church tries to reach out to the unsaved person by making the church experience as comfortable, inviting, and non-threatening to him as possible. The hope is that the person will believe in the gospel. The idea behind the concept is to get as many unsaved people through the doors as possible, and church leadership, the church leadership, are willing to use nearly any means to accomplish that goal. Theatrics and musical entertainment are the norm in the church service to keep the unsaved person from getting bored as he does with traditional churches. Remember that quote from A.W. Tozer where he's lamenting the fact that so many people are bored with God in today's churches. God is boring. So therefore we have to have this pulsating music and the laser light shows and we have to create a mood, we have to create an environment. Creating a mood is not the anointing of God. It's someone playing with your emotions, but there's no salvation in it. This is just another example, kind of a cute example, and I apologize. We were up in the, uh, up in the front room, and there were some of us guys talking about Disney. I love Disney. I don't have anything against Disney. Let me just say that as a disclaimer. But I saw this article a couple months ago, five lessons the church can learn from Disney. You know? I, there's no lessons that the church can learn from Disney. Right? And I... This isn't in the notes. Let me. I'm going to turn around and read it. Granted, there are some things Disney does that are not applicable to the church at all, and perhaps they even rub you the wrong way, like waiting an hour in line. But it's a fact that Disneyland Park in California, and the Disney parks around the world for that matter, are places nearly every person wants to go repeatedly. What if people were lining up at your church doors to do the same? So you can kind of see, let's do what we can to entice the sinner into church. And that is where the compromise comes. That is where sin enters into the church from sinful lifestyles, and that's where the Holy Spirit gets shut out. C.H. Spurgeon. Now this guy, he lived in the mid uh, mid-1800s. A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. <laughs> was he right or not? He, was, he, was, uh, he caught a lot of flack because he spoke very plainly. And he offended a lot of people, and they got mad at him. And there's another quote I'll show you sometime where he said, frankly, I don't care. He said... We've had too many polite preachers. We need someone to speak the truth. And he was really fed up with the church at that time going down the path of just exactly what we're talking about here, of letting sin into the church because we want to embrace the whole world and bring them into this time and space 
where it's a holy communion, a holy intercourse with the holy God. And we'll, we'll take a look. I, I can't get ahead of myself. So she, uh, this, this is a lady writing and she, um, she, she said there's five lessons we need to learn. And I just picked out two of them. Number two was make it a priority to make magic. <laughs> I don't, the closest thing we have to making magic is Rick and his pumpkin hat. And that's it. <laughs> right? But that's the best we can do. We, we intentionally keep it simple. We worship God. We read the Bible. We study the Bible. We pray together. And if you're bored and tired with that, then you're bored and tired with God. But we're not changing our course. We're not trying to make some sort of magic happen so that you come back for a repeat experience. A.W. Tozer said this, a church fed on excitement is no New Testament church at all. The desire for surface stimulation is a sure mark of the fallen nature, the very thing Christ died to deliver us from. I think that speaks very well to this thing of trying to create such an experience emotionally, psychologically, whatever it is. Paul and Jesus got out after the Gentiles for this. He said, all you guys want, you want some intellectual, you know, wisdom of man to make you go ooh and ah. He said, we want the power of God. Number three was make it a safe place for everyone. Now, you know where this is going, right? What it describes as a safe place, I'll read it to you. Sorry, my back is turned. Shortly after my daughter started training for her job at Disneyland, she noticed it attracts such a diversity of people, culturally, racially, and even in terms of sexual orientation, because Disney makes everyone feel accepted. I couldn't help but blurt out, that's what the church should be the place where everyone wants to be because they feel loved and accepted. Before I could finish my sentence, she finished it for me, but the church is often the last place they want to be because they fear they will be judged. And that second paragraph, anyway, we don't need to go further because I, I don't want to take a whole lot of time. So, you know, we have this model, this paradigm of Embracing everyone, bringing it all in, doesn't matter what you believe, how you live, what you do. We want to embrace all of mankind and bring you into the church. And remember Paul's instruction over and over again, the church is to be the place where God meets with his people. And it's holy. Do you remember what happened when someone walked into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle? Or in the, uh, in the sanctuary? In the temple? They died, Right? That's why they tied a rope around the high priest's ankle, just in case he, in case God killed him. They could at least pull him out without someone else going in there to jeopardize their life. What we do here in a church service is holy. It's to be dedicated to God. It's all about God. It's not about the people. And when we lose that sense of priority and balance, we are going to come up and start doing some really bizarre carnal, evil things. This is just another quick article, The, the Problem with Attractional uh, Evangelism. This is from the Keystone Pro, uh, Project. It says here, I don't know if I have this in your notes or not. In this method, the church attempts to evangelize the community by attracting people to its buildings, services, events, and programs. The idea behind this approach is that you offer people what they want or enjoy, and they come to your church. He brought up, I think, five or six reasons, problems with this type of approach. Number one, it does not make disciples, it attracts consumers. And the attractional method typically appeals to the needs or desires of those it is targeting. And to reach and deliver those needs and desires at a price the target group is willing to pay, this religious consumerism at some point the church must call the attendee to a deeper level of commitment or a sacrifice, which is which it is impossible for them to be a disciple. And, and he goes on to say there that, well, this says it all, verse 
uh, number four, what you win them by is what you win them to. And so you can't win them with carnal appeal and then suddenly want to make them disciples of Christ. What you win them with is what they're coming for, and they're going to expect you to keep dishing it out. Remember, Jesus, very early in his ministry, when the crowds were following him, he turned around and he spoke to the crowds and he said, wait a minute, people, listen, you got to understand, you want to flock to me, you want to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, learn of my ways. And he let them know that right up front. This is not about a goosebump, feel good, give me all I, I desire, give me these wonderful experiences, just cater to my sensuality. He's trying to tell them it's not that at all. You follow me, you're going to die on a cross. You're going to surrender all. And you can't follow me, you can't be with me unless you're willing to do that. Spurgeon, again, the very church which the world likes best is sure to be that which God abhors. I've showed you that before. So let's look at Jesus' standard for his church. And let's see what how the Bible compares to, I mean, what we just talked about was such a thumbnail sketch, a broad view of what's happening in the American church today. Not everywhere, but in a lot of places. Let's see what Jesus' has standard for his church is. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be what? Holy and without blemish. That's Jesus' mandate for the church. That's Jesus' mandate for Westgate Chapel. He's grooming us to be holy and without blemish. That's the standard. And arrogant, willful, deliberate, repeated sin is not tolerated. Period. You'll see that as we go on. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus talking to his disciples because he said, when I go away, the Holy Spirit will come to you and I will send him to you as your helper, your comforter. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This is what the church does. If your church is not teaching you about sin, righteousness, and judgment, the Holy Spirit is not there. He's left the building. Remember, I've showed you that quote before. The largest church in America, the pastor says he never teaches on hell because people are already discouraged enough and, you know, they don't want to come and hear a bummer of a sermon. Frankly, I think if you know that you're going to hell, but your sins have been forgiven and you're saved and transformed into a new creature headed for heaven, I think that would be an encouragement, not a discouragement, right? But we don't talk about hell because, you know, that's kind of controversial and we got a lot of religions coming in here and some people believe it and some people don't. And Listen, could it be any clearer if the Holy Spirit is in the church, in a church, in a gathering, then he, you will be convicted of sin, which is not enjoyable. How many of the last time you were convicted of sin said, oh, this feels so good, please just pour it on? It's uncomfortable. If you really teach the Bible, then when unsaved people come in, they're going to be uncomfortable. It's called Conviction. But not only is the Holy Spirit teaching what's wrong, he also teaches us what's right. In other words, he teaches us how to live in righteousness. He teaches us how to obey God. And thirdly, he teaches us of judgment. And he goes on to say, verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. 
Satan's kingdom has been destroyed by the resurrection of Jesus. His days are numbered. He has been dethroned. He has no power, no authority against the church. He has been judged. And humans, you're next. You're going to be judged. There's a judgment coming. You better be ready for that day of judgment. The Holy Spirit will convict of sin because we don't, we don't believe in God. We have unbelief. We don't accept that He is the only way, truth, and life. We don't believe that His commandments are right and just. We believe that we can just kind of do whatever we want to do. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and because we don't have Jesus here in the flesh anymore, modeling for us the godly life, we have the Holy Spirit instructing us how to live godly and holy. But if there is a church, and that church is not bringing conviction for sin, teaching on righteousness, and warning of the coming judgment, the Holy Spirit is not in that church. And they might be doing a whole lot of games and activities and events and feel-good moments. And you, you know, you're going to discover your destiny and be a success in life and God is for you and it's just one big pip rally for you. Holy, that's not the Holy Spirit. And that is what allows sin into the church, further robbing any power of the Holy Spirit that might be left. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named. The King James says it, says it this way. Let it, let it not be once named. Now, things happen. Saints fall. Saints backslide. Christians get involved in sinful situations and sinful activities. But he's saying on an ongoing basis here, these type of sins should never be named in your midst. And this congregation, this assembly, is a separate holy people. Yes, we are riddled with faults and failures, and yes, we still sin occasionally. That's not what he's saying. But he's talking about a repeated, recurring pattern where I deliberately, willfully demand my own way, and oh, by the way, I still want to come to church and be called a Christian. He said, these things must not even be named once among you, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. That, that stuff doesn't belong in a church. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, full of envy, full of jealousy, greed, these people have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Saying, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm sober one day out of the week, but I'm a Christian. I want to tell you something. There is no sin, there is no addiction, there is no habit that the Spirit of God cannot break and deliver you from. Period. Sure, it may take a while. Maybe you need a little extra help in counseling or rehab or whatever, but there, there's nothing, there's no sin that overtakes you that Jesus' power is not sufficient to set you free. So let no one deceive you with empty words. Well, you know, I'm just kind of this way because I've had a bad life. And, and that is one thing that you do have to consider. I was amazed at Paul's, what Paul said last Sunday, where was it, like 70 or 80% of people in prison have been the victim of violence themselves? And so you learn it. That's what shapes and molds your thinking and your character and your personality. And, and you feel sorry for those people. And yes, addiction is a horrible thing to break and get free from. But he's saying... For someone who loves sin, who continues to indulge in sin, don't let them deceive you by telling you empty words of, I'm a Christian. 
Spurgeon said this, another proof of the conquest of a soul for Christ will be found in a real change of life. If the man does not live differently from what he did before, both at home and abroad, his repentance needs repented of, and his conversion is a fiction. When Jesus comes into your heart, there's a change. And if you're not changed, then you haven't been converted. There's been no repentance. There's been no salvation. He goes on, let me go to the next passage, 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Now watch the wording there, it's very clear. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. It doesn't say you're sinlessly perfect. It doesn't say you never sin again, because we all occasionally do. And John, in 1 John, in, in the earlier chapters, addresses that. But if you are truly born again, you don't just keep on sinning. It makes you miserable. You know you're not right with God. And there's something that there's the life and the breath of the Spirit of God beating in your heart that says, I can't do this anymore. How dare I offend the holiness of my God? How dare I betray the trust and the love of him who died on the cross for me? And if you have any kind of a reawakened conscience, there's something that cries out in you that says, God, I've got to be delivered from this. I hate this. I don't want to be this way anymore. Sin, no one who abides in him. Sin dies in the presence of God. And if you've really been in the presence of God, the sin will be decreasing in your life. Not totally gone, because that will come when we receive our new bodies. But if someone, he's talking about people who call themselves Christians, if they keep on sinning, don't let them deceive you with empty words because they've never seen him. They don't know him. Someone who continues in sin does not know God. They don't have a personal relationship with him. So don't be deceived. Little children, let, let, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteous righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. He came to set you free from sin. He came to break the bands of bondage off of you so that you could live lives of obedience and holiness. J.C. Ryle, he was a great man of God. A little, not as known as much as the others, but he said, he said this, if you show me a man deliberately living an unholy and licentious life, and yet boasting that his sins are forgiven, I answer, he is under a ruinous delusion and is not forgiven at all. I would not believe he is forgiven if an angel from heaven affirmed it, and I charge you not to believe it too. Now listen to this. Pardon of sin and love of sin are like oil and water. They will never go together. And he's saying this, pardon of sin, if you're truly pardoned for your sin, if you've come to God with godly sorrow and you hate the betrayal of God's love, you hate how you offended his holiness, if you are truly sorry in your heart, then you want to get as far away from sinning like that as you can. You want to do whatever it takes to make sure you never are involved in that again if you truly have a repentant and converted heart. And so he's, he's trying to say here, you know, people who just glibly talked about, oh, Jesus has saved me and forgiven me, but they continue in a lifestyle and a habit of sin, they're not saved. They don't know godly sorrow. They've never repented they're not sorry for who and what they were. 
He said those things don't go together. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. John is, the apostle John is just wailing, isn't he? You're not a, you're not born of God if practice, if sinning is comfortable to you. Why? Because God's seed abides in you. And that seed of the Word of God will not let you go. It will not let you continue down that path. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Must be a truck outside, I think. Verse 10, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So I think it's pretty obvious what he's saying here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. When does he come and make his dwelling among us? Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them. Touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. Then I will welcome you. When does he welcome us? When does he come and fill our service with his spirit and with his power? When? When we go out from the midst of the world and the sin and we're separate from it. Now, say everybody thought that was Old Testament. It's not. It's clearly right here in the New Testament. I put down down there in the notes, it's eternally better to have ten people with pure hearts than a thousand people with compromised purity. Because if we lose the purity of our assembly, God won't be here anymore. He will withdraw His Spirit. Do you know in a lot of these... The, the mega churches, and I'm not speaking against mega churches specifically, but now, you know, they have uh, computer programs and people that are going to help and volunteer in the church and teach the children's ministry. You know, they'll sell you software that connects to law enforcement databases. And so when this person wants to come and work in the children's ministry, you know, they can tell whether you have a criminal record or not. Well, if the best thing that I can say about you is that, well, I don't see any criminal activity, <laughs> that's not a very high standard, is it? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you born again? Do you have a gift of ministering to teach to children and breaking down the truths of God to minister to them? And so it's so much better when we stay close-knit and we know the hearts of those that are around us and we know they have a lifestyle. Jesus is standard for his church, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I really, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 instead. We'll just skip over that one because I think I'm going to have to shut it down here. We'll have to pick this up next week. I was hoping to get through all of it this time, but it just won't happen. He says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul, the apostle, talking to his son Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and what? Buttress of the truth. If truth cannot be found anywhere on this earth, it needs to be found in the church. People believing it, people living it. And there's one phrase back here. I don't want to go through this whole, uh, don't want to go through this whole passage here, but I want you to see 
one thing. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. God's firm foundation stands. He's talking about the foundation of the church. The foundation stands firm, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord do what? Depart from iniquity. Now, what is a seal? Back in the good old days, if you had gotten a message from the king, it would have been probably wrapped up in a scroll of some kind. And what did they do? They took some wax and they melted it on the edge to hold it, hold this, the, the roll shut. And then he would make an impress of his ring or some form of official symbol into the wax. And so when you were handed that scroll, you go, oh, this is authentic. This is from the king himself. That is his very impression in the wax. And this hasn't been tampered with or changed in any way. It's coming straight from his mouth. So when he says here that God's firm foundation bears this seal, what he is saying is this is how you know whether or not the church is authentic. And if it doesn't bear this seal, it's not the real thing. The seal that confirms the authenticity is this. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord do what? Depart from iniquity. Otherwise, it's not the real thing. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit is not there. We'll have to pick this up and we'll get into some more of the practicalities because I want to go on and I want to show you next week there's two sins in church which will always bring God's judgment into that church. Willful sins and secret sins. And we'll take a look at that next week. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And Father, church is not a social club. It's not a community event. Church is where your members, your children come together and form a holy assembly, a holy temple. Church is all about you, Father. It's not about us. It's so that you might receive the praise that you deserve. And as this assembly stays pure and holy, you have promised that you would receive us and walk among us, which is what we want. We want you to move freely. We don't want there to be any hindrance in this assembly that interferes with what you want to do. And so, Father, we pray that we would learn what the church is from your word and that what we learn would cast down all of man's devices and man's de inventions. And we pray that in purity we would be your bride, holy without blemish. That in purity we would be your very body. And you don't partner with sin. We thank you for your mercy that there's times when we are overcome in a moment of weakness or a moment of stress and we do or say things that are sinful, but immediately our heart smites us and we repent and ask forgiveness. Father, that's all under the blood of Jesus. It's the recurring sin that you are warning against. It's the willful, deliberate sin. And then it's the bragging that I am a Christian, even though I live this way. Father, that's what you want us to be on guard against. Because if Satan is able to bring sin into the church, then he has a foothold in the church. And the more sin that enters, the more the Holy Spirit departs. And then we're just left with an empty shell of human religious activity that sends people to hell. So, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would come and prepare our hearts 
for those who can make it, bring us back tonight to see the testimony of such a man of courage through 14 years of torture. Father, he counted the cost. He took up his cross. He denied himself. And we want to be the same way. And so as we go, we just ask that you would keep us safe. We thank you for each person here in this room and for Lisa and Dana and Sharon on Skype. And we pray that you would richly bless each heart and each home here. In Jesus' name, amen.